Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Gina Sorrell back to Literati, albeit virtually, in support of the wise women and in conversation this evening with Jane L. Rosen. Just a quick webinar overview for uh, our attendees. The chat is closed this evening, but you can keep the chat window open as I will be sharing links to purchase the wise women from Literati throughout the event. The Q&A is accessible to you, however, and we encourage you to use that to submit your questions at any time. I'll read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation this evening. And live transcription is available to you as well at the bottom of your screen using the CC icon should you need it. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, you can always find links to purchase books from Literati in the description directly below me. You can also like and subscribe to our channel to be kept up to date with all of our events once they become available on our channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. But most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon uh, or much later this evening, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. After two decades working as an actor, Gina Sorrell returned to her first love writing. A graduate with distinction of UCLA Extension Writers Program, she is the author of Mothers and Other Strangers, a uh, staff pick at Literati Bookstore. Uh, originally from Johannesburg, Gina has lived in New York and Los Angeles and now lives in Toronto with her husband and son. Gina balances the solitary hours of fiction writing with the work as a creative and director and brand storyteller under the banner of her own agency, Words Make the Brand. Joining her in conversation, Jane L. Rosen is, the author and, is an author and screenwriter whose critically acclaimed first novel, Nine Women, One Dress, has been translated into 10 languages. She lives in New York City and on Fire Island with her husband and three daughters. Please join me in welcoming Gina Sorrell and Jane L. Rosen into your living rooms. Hello, thank you so much for having us. Thank you everyone. It's great to be interviewing the wonderful Gina Sorrell. Uh, before we start with the inside of the book, I'd love to ask about the outside of the book. The <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. How did this come about? Did you have any part in it? I just love everything about it. I am incredibly lucky. I thank you. I love the cover as well. And um, I was really lucky. I got a lot of input into the cover. So I, um, I developed a Pinterest board and I took pictures in the bookstore of all the different covers that I loved and that I was obsessed with. And as you can tell, I love flowers. I have them all mm -hmm. around here. And, uh, and I was able to share that with my publisher, Harper Collins, and the design team was super collaborative and really generous and took a lot of my ideas. And they had incredible ideas and a whole bunch of different uh, cover options. So we had some that were illustrated, we had some that were like much more literal than then some that sort of felt like very like modern art kind of evocative. And, and I really was leaning towards something that I wanted two things with the cover. I either wanted it to be um, representative of what was happening inside of the book, like symbolically somehow, or I wanted it to evoke a feeling that was in the book. And for me, this book was really written as um, I wanted it to be a balm. I wanted it to be uplifting and hopeful and the characters are going through so much but there really is possibly this chance of better days ahead even though they're not the days that they planned and so that's what that blue sky looking ahead is to me and things mm -hmm. are in bloom and there's three different flowers one for each woman and so uh, I thought they did a fantastic job of capturing it. That's amazing because in truth it just looks abstract and beautiful but mm -hmm. you just gave so much background to why you know all these things are happening on Fantastic. I love it. Thank do you, you enjoy so the cover work? Do you enjoy picking covers? Yeah, I do. I, I, I really, um, I love working on it. You know, I love design and like a lot of people, you know, I'm a design enthusiast, but you know, I'm not a pro. Right. And so I have, I think I have enough vocabulary to be able to communicate hopefully what it is that I'm looking for or what I'm attracted to and why, but then I have to hand it over to professionals because I can't actually execute it, you know, but um I also really like clear, strong typography, and I wanted a cover that was hopefully timeless. I'm a slow writer, you know. It was <laughs> it's five, it's five years since my since my last book, and I thought, oh gosh, I don't want it to be so current and poppy that 
you know, by the time the next book comes out, it looks dated and dated, you know, so I wanted it to be something that would hopefully look great on a shelf for a very long time and attract people's attention. You did it. It really pops. It's fantastic. Thank you. What inspired you to write The Wise Women? I really wanted to, um, you know, it's interesting, like it started with Clementine and it um, started with this idea of what happens when the life that you're living isn't exactly the life that you thought you were going to be living. Like what happens when the rug gets pulled out from underneath you? I had, I was in a similar situation myself. Um, You know, I had been working at a company for a very long time, working with a company, I should say, for a very long time. And I really liked it. And then the company went through this whole reorganization and my role as I knew it was no longer going to exist. And I had also published um, Mothers and Other Strangers, you know, it had been well received, it had done well. But then I'd written a book that didn't find a home afterwards and I ended up switching representation and I found myself, you know, without an agent. And I mean, it was an amicable parting of ways, you know, without a publisher, it wasn't what they were looking for. Like there was no ill will, it just was, everybody was going in a different direction. And, you know, they were all going away from me. And so, I, you know, I was, and so it wasn't what I thought my future was going to look like. And I had really worked hard to build things up to a place that felt settled. So I wanted to spend time looking at that and exploring that. And, um, and that's how the book starts. You know, Clementine thinks her life is one thing and discovers it's something else. And what, what happens in those moments? You know, how do you move forward? how do you not just move forward, but how do you work towards having the life that you hope that you would have? So that was, that was really where it started. And then I also wanted it to be uplifting. You know, I wanted to approach it through the lens of having humor and wit and heart. And, um, and that's, 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 so that's where I, that's where I started with is this idea of um, what happens when the rug gets pulled up from underneath you. And also what happens when you feel betrayed you know, either like in a non-traditional sense, like her husband is a lie to her. And then also just, you know, you feel betrayed because the life that you were setting up for yourself didn't work out. Like, how do we go forward? And I I think that's something we can all relate to. You know, we've all been pivoting and looking at futures that don't look like what we thought they would look like these last two years. So um, that was uh, all just poured in there. I see that you always rate or not all, your books are um, about mothers. Yeah big way. How is your relationship with your own mother? Do you take that as inspiration or? Yeah, I have a terrific relationship with my mother. I mean, we're really great friends and I'm really fortunate for that. Um, But I am fascinated by that mother daughter relationship. You know, my mom had a complicated relationship with her own mom, yet I was close to my grandmother, you know? And so that always fascinated me as well, how you can have one person can be so many different things to their children to their other family members. They can be viewed through a different lens. You know, there's also people who I met when my gran was still alive. And, uh, you know, she a lot of, she was a big influence on my first book, Mothers and Other Strangers, but people who would meet her and have an entirely different sense of who she was. You know, it was just so clear to me, she had this whole other life and all these other, she met all these different things to different people. And that's, that's always been something that has really fascinated me. And then I want, this time around, I wanted to explore, you know, what's that like with siblings? You know, children have a different relationship with their parents, like no relationship is the same for two children or for siblings with their parents. You know, they each have a completely unique take on their own childhood. The way that I view the way that we grew up is completely different than the way my sister would or my brother would, you know, and also we were treated differently, right? Because we came at different points in my parents' life. I'm the youngest. I got away with a lot more. Me too. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's true, right? That's do you, do you have do you have a lot of Yes, it's unbelievable how much more I got away with. Yeah. I think that and I could see it now. I have three yeah. daughters, but they're tired by the third or the fifth. <laughs> you're, not really, you're not really up to the task the way you were maybe with the first. Yeah. So I get yeah. it. And that was very interesting to me in reading the book, because Barb and Clementine had very different relationships with Wendy. Yeah. And different um like you said different memories yeah 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 very different I have I have one child and so um I feel for him because he is every experience is the first and the last so he doesn't get that benefit of me being tired and being like okay we'll try it differently like sort of all, all, I'm on everything so yeah I like Wendy's advice is peppered throughout the book yeah and this seems to capture the heart of the novel 
Uh, you can never really start over, but if we're lucky, we can start again. Can you talk about why you wanted to write about the unexpected path? I think so many of us have this idea when we're younger of what our lives will look like, or maybe just a vision for it, a hope for it, you know? And, and I think, I think it's less so now, but when I was younger, certainly there was this sense of you had to, there were certain steps that you were going to take to get to a place in your career. You know, I mean, as an actor, there were certain steps that I needed to take, right? I had to go to school and then you had to get an agent and then you, you know, you, or you first actually do the small parts to get the agent's attention. And then you got the agent to get the bigger parts. So there's this sort of progression that happens, you know, and also um, in the academic world as well, or people, you know, have careers like lawyers, doctors, you know, there's this sense of you, you go to school for this many years. And then I was an actor for a very long time for two decades really. Wow. And, um, and I loved it. I mean, I loved the, I loved the performing part of it. I loved the creation part of it. I didn't love the business part of it, the waiting on other people, the when do I get to get to an audition or, you know, there's no parts for me this season. So I'm just like sitting at home twiddling my thumbs. Like I, I hated feeling at the mercy of other people. And so I ended up having a very, um, uh, different path, like a very unconventional path myself. You know, I moved to Los Angeles with my husband for, you know, we went during pilot season. We really liked it. He's an actor as well. We stayed, we got our green cards, you know, we worked towards getting our green cards. We moved and then we just went all in, right? We're all in going to be actors in Los Angeles after having worked in Canada for a long time. And he, he did really well and he was working quite steadily and I was working sort of sporadically, but, you know, I was, making money and I was having these long gaps in between and I just found myself so unsatisfied with the waiting. I felt unfulfilled. I don't have that kind of personality that I'm like, oh great, I have all this free time that's you know paid for in between gigs. I'm like, I want to be doing something. So, you know, I went to UCLA and I took a, a class there and I really I got, got back to my writing, which I really loved. And I met my mentor Caroline Levitt, who's now a really dear friend of mine who I adore. Love, love, love her. Love I, I her. Stay with me forever. Yeah. I mean, she's, she's just incredible, right? She's just incredible. So, um, you know, and then while I was there, like Caroline actually had, was, had introduced, you know, you'd be your improviser, you'd be really good at naming, you know? And so she introduced me to somebody that got me started on my naming path, you know? So I was, I was doing naming and then I was also trying to make ends meet. So I was also, um, like in between jobs, right? I was like, I made, I made jewelry. And so I was making jewelry and I was selling jewelry. And what's naming? Oh, naming. I name products and companies. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's an actual job. It's so bizarre. So, you know, so I was doing that. And then I was like copywriting and it's sort of these, but the fact that like, it was such an unconventional path to the naming and branding storytelling world, which I worked in. And the fact that I got there was, in an unconventional way, you know, I got a recommendation and, you know, the person who hired me said, oh, you're an improviser. You'd probably be good at this. So you can just think things and you're creative. And that led to a job, which led to another job, which led to writing copy. And then, you know, then I sort of spent more time developing the novel writing, but I didn't go to university for it is what I'm saying. You know, I didn't do all of the steps. I decided to go to UCLA and do the writer's program, which was fantastic. It was a three-year program and I did that, but Still, like I had spent my whole life in performing arts schools to be an actor, you know, follow that trajectory, got to LA, wasn't what I wanted. Found myself going to this branding, storytelling, writing, naming world, you know, meeting my mentor, then doing like all of these things were out of order. Now, looking back, I can say they all make sense. I can say they're all part and parcel of the same thing. It's all about telling stories whether you tell it with one word, like a name, or you tell it with romance copy on the back of an ice cream package, or you tell it mm -hmm. in a novel, it's all the same thing, but it was a really unconventional way to get there. And I hope, my hope is that that's inspiring to people, you know, that there are other ways to get to where we want to go. You know, not all of us have the avenues open to us um, that are, that are the traditional paths, you know, not everybody is going to go to, a, maybe not everybody can afford to go to a school that has the program that they want or can move to the city that is best at that thing. So I think that that can often be intimidating to people or let them think that they don't have a chance to get in. There's too many obstacles in the way. And I've always been about going, 
oh, well, there's that obstacle. Okay, how do I get around it? So it's just another way to get around it. And so I, I wanted to put that in the book as well. Excellent. Very, very inspirational. And I hope that one day you'll write something called pilot season because I will. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Um, so I guess that's a lot of somewhat answering what do you hope readers to take away? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I hope that, you know, I hope that people uh, take away this idea that it's never too late. You know, it's never too late to try something new. It's never too late mm-hmm. to turn things around. It's never too late to um, to just redirect to redirect your life. Uh, you know, and of course, I know, I know that there's so many things that play into that. You have to have means. You have to have agency. You have to have support. I understand that. But you know, even if it's never too late to look at something differently, you know, I think so much of it is perspective. That's also we have these ideas of what does success look like. What does a family look like in the book? You know, what does a successful parenting relationship look like? And there's no one fits all size. You know, we think we're allowed to define that for ourselves and we're allowed to try and form that in as many different ways as possible until we find the one that works for us. I saw that in the book. There were like a lot of moments where I thought it was going to go in one direction and it could have gone in that direction with the, all three of the women and then it went in a different direction. So it just showed all the choices that would have all been, you know, fine storytelling devices. But I loved the way I was never really sure. It kind of kept me guessing. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. Um, can you talk about how your obsession with real estate influenced the narrative? I'm completely obsessed. <laughs> so I mean, oh, you I are. That, I think that a lot of people are. But I think, you know, my mom is a real estate agent. My sister is a real estate agent. Um, my husband and I renovated this tiny little house that we, our first ever house ourselves with a friend and then sold it at a profit. We've all done that to fund the next move in my family. My cousin's an architect. One of my best friends since childhood works in development. I mean, it's just everywhere. And it's, you know, I think it's a current obsession with people right now. I mean, SNL did that really great sketch of people like watching Zillow together instead of, you know, watching some steamy, sexy movie and they're looking at Zillow. <laughs> sense, you know? And I was like, yes. <laughs> Um, and even though I'm like happily settled, like my mom still sends me listings. Then we get on the phone, we talk about it. You know, what did you think of that reno? Or could you believe it went for that much? Or how many days on market? You know, they don't even have parking. Like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's everywhere. Like we're, cons- we're, you know, we're consumed with it. And I think those of us who live in cities and even who don't, you know, are just so aware of how expensive it has become to own anything. You know, I mean, you and I were talking just before we got on this um, on this event about how when I first moved to New York, I, you know, I lived on the Upper East Side. And when I think that I had this tiny little apartment and I had a roommate and it was probably like maybe 650 square feet and it was seven hundred and seventy five dollars and it was a six flight walk up. And that was all the money in the world to me. And I shared it with someone. I mean, I paid half of that, you know, and like, there's no way I would even be able to rent a place like that now. I mean, it's just, it's so expensive. Um, and I think so, you know, but, but that be, it becomes a measure, it becomes a barometer of our success, our ad, it can be our addresses, you know, it can say so much about us. I'm someone who's always lived on the East side. Um, I've lived on the East side in Toronto, in New York. I live on the East side in Los Angeles. It's a certain type of person who lives on the east side, not nearly as cool as those who live on the west side, but that's okay. I'm not so cool. And so <laughs> if I say to people, oh, I live on the east side, they're like, oh yeah. You know, <laughs> and so like, and I think that we do that for each other, you know, and um, and then it changes once you have children and you move into an area where a school code, like school districts become really important. You know, what kind of school is your kid going to go to? And you want to be in a certain neighborhood. And there's just this pressure. So you know, the, the fun part of real estate is the looking at how people live and the looky-loo, the window shopping of homes. And then I wanted to sort of peel back the other layers in the book that are also about what it says about us, what it says about our need to have a certain address, what it says about um, our school systems in terms of being defined by where we live. Also what it says about us that we want to move into these really cool hip places and then gentrify them and make them look like other places, then why don't we just stay in the place that we were at, you know? And there's only so much space in a city. And what happens when we start like gobbling it all up and that that kind of pressure that we start to feel. So um, I want to, yes, and Barbara's a really great outlet for that. She was some, you know, working as a, in development and also in design as an architect. Um, she struggles with that herself. 
you know, and I got to kind of put all of those concerns into her. Yeah, I love that. And I also loved that she was in Brooklyn and Clementine was in Queens. Where was she? Sunny, sunny side? Sunny side. Yeah. Yeah. And then the mom was in Manhattan. And if you're from here, you know, like I'm from Manhattan and it's just such a universe of uh, everything's just shifting, you know, constantly shifting. Yeah. And it's interesting because so many people are in Brooklyn, all, like you said before, everyone's yeah. like moving to Brooklyn and, and now everyone's moving to Queens and now people are yeah. coming back yeah. to Manhattan. It's all a shifting thing. And I guess it's like that maybe in every city. I just Yeah, I just, yeah. Toronto has just absolutely exploded where I am. And it's, you know, it's the same thing. Like there's, my husband and I are basically like, we will just never move. Like we can't, you know, like we're here, yeah. forever. we're here forever. That's it, you know. It looks beautiful. I think you'll be okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you learn while writing this book? Oh gosh, you know, I learned to, um, I learned to really enjoy writing again in a way that I hadn't for a while. You know, I had, I had no agent. I had no publisher. I was writing this book for me. And I, um, I had no expectations on it except for my own. You know, I really knew that I wanted to be published again. I really knew that I wanted to have another book. And I also knew that I wanted it to be lighter than my first book, which was quite, you know, very literary and very dark and very twisty. And then the follow-up to that book that didn't find representation was also very dark and very twisty. It was a male protagonist and there was no mother, no mother daughter relationships in that one. But, um, you know, but those were both really demanding books and they took a lot out of me. And this one did as, as well. Like I find writing, you know, challenging and difficult and hard and all those things. Um, and I'm a slow writer, but, um, I had fun with these women, you know, I learned that it was like, I learned like relax, like just enjoy it more, you know, like it's just words on a page. You can move them around a million different ways and there's so many different options for them. And also um, that there was just a lot of fun to be had in that, you know, I allowed myself to take little detours and add other characters, you know, secondary characters that were delightful, that made me smile and made me laugh, you know, and that entertained me. And I found that entertainment part of it again, which I really enjoyed. And that was something which I was like, you know, I wanted to put that across so that other people would have that when they read it. So the process of um, writing it was something that was, it, like, it was, it was, it was a real turning point for me. You know, I, I didn't show my pages to a lot of people at the beginning, at the very beginning, I would, you know, I, I, like Caroline had seen like some opening pages, Robert Evers, a prof of mine had seen some. And then at, you know, at the very end, I have a friend who's an editor, Andrea Robinson, who had seen them, you know, and that's, that was it. Cause there was just, you know, people to take a look at it, but I kept those pages pretty close. And, um, and it was really, yeah, it was, it was something that was very comforting and a great solace to me working on this book. Have you seen your last book you said was five years ago published? Yeah. Have you, what do you think about May, the difference? May. <laughs> between um, then and now in publishing have you seen any differences yeah I was at a small press for that book so that press doesn't exist anymore it was sold to um excuse me <clears throat> it was sold to Turner Publishing and uh, it was Prospect Park Books and they were great they were lovely they did a beautiful job with it but um you know that was a that was a very small press and now you know there's there's been so many acquisitions by larger houses and I think they're also what I've noticed is the demand for the work to be at you know a really spectacular level, even when you first take it out, is is probably higher. I don't know if that's true of the industry or if that's just me. Like I don't really show my work until I feel like it's really ready to be seen. Um, but yeah, I feel like you know it has changed. On the plus side, I feel like people are reading more than they ever did before. I feel like there's more, yeah, I feel like there's more outlets for it. I feel like there's more opportunities. You know, you look at places like um, Instagram and those bookstagrammers are phenomenal you know reading sharing like promoting your book telling other people to read it I mean I am so grateful to that community you know that is absolutely huge and and just the fact that people take the time to do that that wasn't available to me before or maybe I wasn't even aware of or as involved before I don't have you felt a lot of changes well my sophomore novel Eliza starts a rumor came out right during COVID right at the beginning so I love that book I love Thank that book. Loved Thank it. Thank you. 
if it wasn't for the bookstagrammers, I don't even know if anyone would have known about that book, to be honest with you. So I am like forever indebted to those women. They're unbelievable. It's not like they get paid. They just read and, and write right. and take amazing pictures. And I, I really believe that no one would have known my book because wow. there it was with a beautiful cover and no one could go into a bookstore. Wow. So, and I had a big space between my first and second also, four years. So yeah. I agree, they are wonderful. Yeah, and so that's a change. And then there's less magazines, which is less magazines. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> big deal. Yeah. And maybe sure. not. You know, I mean, I want to get into magazines, but it's definitely few and far between. So yeah, yeah there's definitely changes. Yeah, there are. But there's changes. also good changes. I mean, it's really interesting that these young women are so into influencing with books, and mm -hmm. it's. I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's fantastic. You know, and there, and also like book talk. You know, people are just out there like, I'm just going to make a video for your book. I just liked your book and I'm going to tell the whole world about it. Yeah, and it's, that's hysterical. It's such a generous gift, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's also been some men that have really responded to my book as well, which has been so nice and put it on their, wow. on their Instagrams, which is so great. Um, I think it's, I think it's really lovely. And I think that um, like, I think more, it feels like, it feels to me like more people are reading, more people are talking about books and in a way as well, that is about entertainment. You know, and that's really important to me too. Like we all talk about, oh, what show are you watching? You know, what series are you binging? With the, with the completely mm -hmm. with the expectation of that, I'm going to be entertained. You know, and sometimes I have felt in the past that I don't know if if reading got the same lens allowed towards. You know, the same lens on it. It was given the same permission to be an escape or to be entertaining. You know, and like I think of something like. Scandal or Grey's Anatomy or anything Shondaland, which is wonderful, but you know, anything can happen there, right? Like, you know, someone can like knock on the door and be your long lost twin evil sister who's got this secret, you know, and, <laughs> and we go with it. We're like, yes, of course, that's fine. You know, succession, like how many helicopters does one family have? I mean, I know he's terrible, but you know, it's, but sometimes when we read, you think, oh, this has to, I'm not sure this would have exactly happened this way. I'm not sure this is really plausible. And I'm like, look, I just sat down and I watched an entire show where if like a young woman went to Paris and, you know, didn't speak a word of the language and was like, now, you know, <laughs> and family. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think it's okay that we allow ourselves to have a little bit of a leap of faith here. So, you mm -hmm. know, to suspend, with that suspension of disbelief, right? To allow that to happen. And I feel like, and then one of the things that I really love is that, you know, some people are, I was talking today just with a colleague who said, you know what, I picked up your book and it was a guy, which was so nice. He said, he said to me, you know, I've been reading all of these really challenging, really demanding books that are nonfiction and that are really like testing me and that take so long to get through. And then I just thought, oh, I just want, I just need a break. I just want to enjoy myself for a while. And I, and I was like, and, and he's like, and I was laughing and I was reading and I was enjoying it. And I was like, yeah, that's also what reading is supposed to be. Right. So yeah, it's supposed to be educational, of course. It's supposed to like allow us to have empathy and to experience other people's worlds and to give us a lens and a place, you know, an opportunity to go places where we might not normally. But it should also, I think, you know, I it should engage you. It should entertain you. It should be a joy. And it should be a break, like a little yeah. aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever's I, going on. I yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah. And it takes a real man to read a book with this cover. Oh my God. And to buy it in hard copy, which, you know, in Canada, even right. <laughs> yeah, I know. My first book was pink. And I did a whole little video of all the men that read the book. And I said, it takes a real man to read a pink book. But this, this is close, Gina. I'm very, I'm very lucky. <laughs> Both my men, my son and my husband are very fan, Like they're fans of the pale, of the color pale pink. My whole dining yeah. room is pale pink. So, <laughs> they put so I think that we might be ready. Oh. For the lightning rounds. Oh boy. Okay. You ready? I'm going to ask you quick questions. Well, first, let me ask you do you have a favorite between Wendy, Clementine, and Barb? I love them all. And I think, I know that's not a good answer. I love, honestly, I see myself in all of them, parts of myself in all of them, you know? And so that's something that, like, I'm a mom like Clementine, you know, I'm, I work like a maniac like Barb does you know, and, uh, and I'm, I'm a bit of a meddler like Wendy. I'm also, my mom's a bit of a meddler. So, you know, I think like I have a soft spot for her for that. Um, and I also, there's secondary characters that I really enjoyed, you know, like I like Samantha Love the influencer and I love Dominic. Like, um, no, I, I think it was interesting. It, I, um, 
I, I did. Like I, at first, I think I, I, it changed. I was like, oh, I'm Clementine. That's the one I like the best. Then I was like, no, I like Barb, you know, then it was Wendy. Did you have one that you liked the best? Um, I think Clem, Clementine. Yeah. I mean, I read it a long time ago. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I just felt for her and I just something about her. I was just thought she was a good mom. And I, I just thought I was rooting for her. Yeah. Like I, the other two would end up on their feet, but she seemed like, right. No, that's yeah. actually, no, that's a great point. It's true. The other two would definitely land on their feet and she yes. might wobble and fall down for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I was more worried about her choices that she was going to make. Yeah. So. Great ramifications too, because she has a child, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's where my, not that what was great also about the book is that you didn't, sometimes you read a book and you're so much more interested in one story than in the other story that you almost want to skip to it. But I didn't feel like that with this book. I was equally want to know what happened to all three women and their journeys. Great. So that, oh, but. that's so good. Okay. Favorite place to write? My office. Oh, your, this is your office that you're in right now? My office. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> I'm very lucky. It's uh, the back of my house on the second floor. And for many years, I didn't have an office. I wrote, you know, in a coffee shop. I wrote at my dining room table. I wrote like a little desk at the bottom of my bed. And then when we came back, this house had an extra room and I claimed it as my own. And my husband always teases me that I always pick the nicest room to be my office. But really what it is, is I just pick the one that has the best light. So it's, it's boiling hot in the summer. It's freezing cold in the winter. So I have an air conditioning unit and I have a little electric heater, but I, I really love it. It gets beautiful light and it looks over on my neighbor's garden and she's got this gorgeous magnolia tree that is just absolutely stunning. Yeah. And I can see all the kids play in the laneway. You know, I know that laneway is a Canadian thing, like a, an alleyway between houses. Oh. So all the kids come out and then they play basketball in the alleyway. And then they run in and out of the backyard. And I can see that, which is really nice. It's called a langway? Lane, like a lane? Laneway, laneway. Yeah, an alleyway. It's usually, yeah. between, it's usually between two backyards. So it's, it would be a street that you would drive up and then people would have their garages that you park in. And then there'd be backyards and then the houses. Hmm. That's so, so interesting. Yeah. We do not have those yet. <laughs> no, I know. I found that out when I wrote lane <laughs> <laughs> in my manuscript. Do you like to write with quiet or music? Both. So I write with quiet when I'm really focusing on what I'm often when I'm revising, I am quiet. And when I'm really focusing on getting it really final choices, really setting the material down. But when I'm generating in early drafts, I, I will over time while I'm writing, I'll develop a playlist that I write to. And I do it for each book. And I do that because it's kind of an acting trick as well. With acting, there is a thing that is, you know, sense memory. And so sense memory is a technique that, you know, you rely on your senses to recall a memory of a time or a place or a feeling so that even if you're having an off experience or an off day or, or not even off, but, you know, you're, you're on set, you have a long break or you're in the theater, it's been a couple of nights and you come back, how do you key in quickly to that state of being that you need? And so sometimes it's something like, uh, you know, it's, or like, it could be something like the way fabric feels, you know, or way a scarf does. It reminds you of something that puts you in that right frame of mind in terms of the performance and that's needed at that moment. And then for writing, the music that I would choose for my characters, the music that I would choose for the book is often the mood that I'm hoping to evoke or feel or one that allows me to just focus on the book. And so I can be gone for days or I could be really busy with something else that's going on in my life, but then I hear that song and it keys me and it puts me back into that place and I can really hone in and focus and write. Wow, that's really an interesting answer. It's, <laughs> I mean, each book has its own soundtrack and they often have like different characters will have their own kind of playlist. You should share the soundtrack. Oh, that's a great idea, that's a great yeah, idea. I wanna see, that's interesting. <laughs> Um, are you, in terms of writing, are you a planner or a seated fly by the seat of your pants? It's the latter working towards planning. Uh, and part of that is because, you know, I'm not going to get it like six years to write my first book again, right? Like that mm-hmm. was, nobody was waiting for me. Um, so that was interesting. Like I figured out as I went along, 
Um, I tend, I started out writing pretty much just, uh, I follow characters when I write. So I have the character, I hear their voice. I think about what it is that they want, what their motivation is. Sometimes it's a line of dialogue. Sometimes it's a, it's a situation. Um, and then I follow them and I follow them through the story. And um, I don't often know where I'm going, but I'm kind of following them on their journey. And then I start to write my first book. I just wrote entirely. And then I revised like a maniac and sort of did the planning afterwards. The second one, which didn't find a home, I was kind of doing it 50 pages in or 85 pages in and then starting a little bit more. You know, this one, I really, I was, I was sort of writing, mapping, writing, mapping, writing, mapping. And then of course, after that first draft, really laying out all the cue cards on a big white erase board ahead of me that I look at and seeing, oh, wow, I've got like seven Clementine scenes in a row. That's not going to work, you know? Right. And then there's all these, and sort of mapping it out that way. I've now I'm working on a, on a book that I actually have outlined all of it. And that's really interesting for me. I didn't think that was something that I could do or wanted to do, but it has been effective in terms of being able to have limited amounts of time sometimes and get back to the page and be like, oh, I'm working on this scene. This is what's coming up next. Because, you know, people probably think I'm joking, but I'm, I'm just not a fast writer. Are you a fast writer? I mean, I don't know what you- are a fast writer, aren't you? Fast writer. I don't know if I'm a fast writer. I mean, like you said, my first book, I, there was no time limit. And I yeah. even thought someone was going to publish it. So I don't even know how long that took me. Eliza, I wrote very quickly. I think I wrote it in seven months. I think that's very quickly. Wow. That is I mean, so the first fast. draft, the first draft. It was that's then amazing. like a year of editing. That's amazing. I thought that was quick. But when I wrote Eliza, my mom passed away right before I started writing it. And I just didn't feel like dealing. And I really threw myself into yeah. constantly writing this book. Yeah. So I'm unsure if that would just like, you know, be in a normal yeah. life situation. Yeah. And uh, a shoe story um, is kind of based on, I had a similar situation. Yeah, it's tell me. us about a shoe story. Tell us about that. So this is my book, A Shoe Story, which is coming out. And it's funny that you said that you had a book that didn't make it which was shocking, right? Because you thought I wrote a book already. Now everything I write is going to get published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So shocking. So the same kind of thing happened to me. I yeah. lost my editor and it was a whole situation. And um, A Shoe Story is partially made up of that book. So it's, it's, it's yeah. I can't really tell you how long it took to write this book because course, it's yeah. like an amalgamation of yeah. And um, yeah, and it's getting such nice buzz. You think? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's getting such nice buzz. So nerve wracking, right? So good, though. Um, so good. Yeah. Okay. Lightning rounds. Return to the lightning round. Do you, you read Goodreads and Amazon reviews? Yes, because I'm a masochist. And so, <laughs> so I do. Um, you know what? I told myself I wasn't going to this time. Lies. I mean, I'm going to read everything, you know. And so uh, it's interesting. I think when people, it's hard when people don't get what you're going for. That's how I look at it. You know, it's not like this is the book that I wrote. But it's also interesting to see their their feedback of what they thought you wrote sometimes. And, and there has to be a valid point there. Like if everyone keeps saying you wrote this kind of thing. But like for mothers and other strangers, yeah, great feedback. But people are like, oh my gosh, this woman's a raging narcissist, which she was the mother, but this psychological thriller of a, you know, this was a family saga thriller. And I was like, I didn't even know that was a category family saga thriller. Like right. that's interesting, you know, like um, I've been thinking, oh, this is mother daughter's complicated relationship. And they, you know, went to this other place, which was great because it opened it up to a new audience. Um, but then there's also pitfalls because that audience is like, there weren't enough twists. And I'm like, well, cause I didn't, mm, okay. <laughs> Yeah, you can't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, oh, sorry. Um, but I have to say that, you know, Goodreads has been really generous to me, which is really lovely. And I've learned not to read every single thing. You know, there's always the ones that sting and the ones that hurt. But, you know, I feel like generally if people are being positive. It's nice. I think also there's 
this been a lot of talk to people about, come on, don't leave a one star to bookmark it so that you remember to go back and read that book. Remember there's a person behind this that has feelings. And I feel like that's- Right, actually, we're not vacuum cleaner cells. Yeah, like- yeah, exactly. But I feel, like that's actually, <laughs> I feel like that's translated. You know, I feel like people are being really, like really respectful and really generous. And so I, that's been really nice too. Um, yeah, but I do read that. And then I do read Amazon once in a while. But Do you check your Amazon numbers? I didn't even know what they were until my first book. And someone said, well, what's your ranking? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and then I started scrolling. So yeah, that's terrible. What about you? Do you look at any of it? Um, yes, I'm, I'm awful. I look at the Amazon numbers and I didn't know that until, I think until my second book, thank the Lord, I got out of it for my first book. But the funny thing is, I think like Goodreads has also been good to me, but there's one review I think on Amazon for Eliza most of the reviews were four or five stars it was wonderful I was very happy one person wrote oof and it's all I could do is to think about that <laughs> that's what I think and it was like first it was first for a very long time it just you turn you opened up Eliza starts a rumor and it said oof oh my gosh like oh my oof what explain more to me what are you trying to say I know I know yeah and the, the thing is is the book is done <laughs> it's the first it's a, now I know better now I know to tell people like when I give them the book and they say I said I hope you like it they go I'll let you know and I say I can't change it Just, <laughs> no, like, I really can't change it because I did have people say you know what I would have done differently and I was like no like no don't tell me like there's there's no second chances here like this book is finished you realize it's printed you know it's not a choose your own adventure ending so um yeah, you know, we all, it, it's such a delicate thing because you want everyone to read it and post their reviews. And at the same time, you know, we're all sitting there kind of nervously hoping that people love it because it takes so much time to write and get out in the world. I know. Which do you prefer, editing or writing a first draft? Definitely revising. Same. Oh, so much more. I mm-hmm. love revising and I'm a ruthless reviser. Like, I love that whole process. Um, but first draft, so I'm great. I'm great for the first like 100 pages. And then it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> like each page. You know, these people have these word counts of like, oh, yeah, I did like, you know, 1200 words today. And I'm like, oh, that's great. That's a couple of days for me. You know, that I'm like, that takes me a while. So um, I really, but I love the revising part of it because I feel like I can work with this. There's something here. I can see where the holes are. Like it's, you know, it's better. It's, it feels a bit different with having an outline this time around. I'm noticing there's less of that pain in the initial first draft. Well, you know where you're going and you know. A little bit. Yeah. 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 I could never do with that. No. Um, okay. What is the oh, last you book? With, you write with an outline? I never look at it again after I write it. I like write it on um, cards. Card? Yeah. Yeah. All the chapters on cards. And then I know I got from point A to point Z with every character. And then I don't really even look at it again. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. It's just it kind of a common thing. Wow. Hmm? It just stays in your brain. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, what's the last book you couldn't put down? I really love separation anxiety and I've talked about it before, but I really loved it. It's Laura Zygmunt's and um, I just love that book it's tender and it's heartbreaking and it's hilarious. And um, it was just so unexpected and I picked it up and I just went through it. Like it was really, it was just fantastic. I was like laughing, crying throughout the book. And so that's yeah. Laura Zygmunt's separation anxiety. I'll have to get that. I it was really it was so lovely. Yeah. And then of course there's so many others that I'm reading, you know, that I really like. And um, but I have to admit that like during this whole process, my reading has slowed down because I've been spending so much time getting the book ready and then doing pre-publication and trying to, you know, like literally like, oh, hi, I'm on Instagram. Like I was on Instagram, but not really. Me and my five followers and my zero posts. Oh, everybody (laughs) please follow. What is it? Is it Gina, at Gina Sorrell? Follow at Gina Sorrell. No, thank you. Thank you. And you're under your name too, aren't you? Yes, but this is about you, Gina. (laughs) Come on, come on. We both have both. Yeah. And what's on your TBR? Um, Oh, what is on my to be read list? I have, gosh, again, there's so many things. Um, What about this? 
Yes, please. Yeah, I'm waiting for my copy. No, but there's so many great books that are coming out. And for all the wonderful women who blurb me, have books coming out, you know? So you have a shoe story and then uh, Courtney Mom's book is com- coming out, which is Year of the Horses. Leon Dolan's book just came out on the same day that my book came out, which I want to, I want to make sure that I say it's the right title for it. I'm going to say it's Lost and Found in Paris. I always want to call it a Paris story. That's because I'm thinking a shoe story. But mm-hmm. Lost and Found in Paris and Amanda Ear Ward's book comes out, The Lifeguards. I want to take a look at that. That Caroline, looks great. That, yeah, that looks great. Caroline Levitt's working on a book, Days of Wonder, which should be out next year. You know, so I go, I do that. I support all of those people, you know, first, which is really great. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot. I really loved uh, Olga Dies Dreaming. So I enjoyed that book so much. And, uh, and then I tend to have this habit of like, I'm buying books for my husband, but I'm also secretly just buying them for myself. I'm like, have you, oh, you're not reading that yet? Oh, I'll, I'll take a look at that. You know, so sort of, I know, I love buying books. That's on my list. And what about you? What are you, what are you looking it. forward to reading next? I think that's all I have. What? What about me? Yeah, what are you what looking forward reading? to reading next? I'm reading right now, um, Home or Away, which yeah. is right here by my, um, my computer is leaning on it and I'm loving it, loving okay. it. And what am I reading next? Oh, I'm gonna read Sister Stardust. Jane Green just sent me that. Yes, nice. Um, I just read Maddie Sinha's book. Yeah. What's it called? Mm. So good. The first one was the White Coat Diaries. Yes. This one, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's excellent. Um, and then I read like research books. So I have a lot of that to read. Like uh, my next book is called Fire Island that's coming out next summer. And there happens to be two other books called Fire Island. Wait, it's, coming out, it's coming out next summer. So you're already- Next June. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm in shock also. That's really fast. I know. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. But we have to go through the first one first, right? Yeah. You can share your, your, your secrets with me for getting a book. I don't, out. that is not a secret either because that book was based on a screenplay because I used to be a screenwriter. So I didn't write, that's like talk about having an outline. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. An outline. So I can't even tell you if I could really do a book a year like so many women do I don't know if I really could in reality without having some of it already done right I think two two I think every two years is my sweet spot I think I can get to a year and a half Mm -hmm. right but that won't be published anyway right I know we'll have we'll have to see what happens I have to get I have to get faster there's only so no I mean it it has to be be satisfied and happy with it right yeah, no, I know. There's, um, I think it's also just, yeah, I think some books come faster. You know, yeah, some books come yeah. faster. This one came faster, which was really nice. You know, if yeah. I found well, the rhythm, it's, found the tone. It's gorgeous. So I'd imagine it's going to grab people's eye. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's important. I always say to people, mm-hmm. if you don't like it, look how pretty it is. And they won't be disappointed. They will not oh, be disappointed. Thank you. thank you so much. Beautiful inside and out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for doing this with me. It was incredibly sure. generous of you and you didn't have to do it. And I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. And I think there's probably some questions, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. we do have, we do have some questions. Um, and also I bring you uh, greetings, Gina, from, from my colleague, Shannon, ah. uh, books, literati bookseller. Um, who has made the wise woman a staff pick at Literati oh, and who writes that Sorel brings a spark to her characters that is rare and brilliant. So if I can uh, allow me to, to try to be as good as a hand seller as Shannon is by reading a bit of her staff review there. Um, but she's got a couple questions for you. Um, the and first- I'll give her a really quick shout out actually. Oh, please, yeah. Of a phenomenal, phenomenal bookseller is Mothers and Other Strangers was sent as a galley to restore to literati, and it was in a pile of galleys, like all galleys are. And though I don't get a lot of galleys, so feel free to send me some. And um, you know, and she picked it up and she took a chance on it. She liked the cover, she liked the first line, and read it, and then loved it, and was honestly responsible for hand selling it. And then got in touch with me, wrote me a beautiful. Um, uh, review and arranged my very first ever book event, which was at Literati, you know, and from there, from having one person like it, 
one person want to sell it, one person want to do an event for me, it kicked things off, you know, and I'm really, I'm forever grateful. It's very generous. Thank you. Um, yeah, our, our books always make all this stuff possible. And like I said, Shannon is, is no one hand sells a book at Literati like Shannon does. So, um, uh, but I do want to ask him for a question. So she asks, what, what is the most surprising thing you discovered while writing this book? I think it was, you know, um, okay, that's a really, I think it was, yeah, I mentioned that finding the joy in it again, but I think it was understanding for myself that there's a lot of like serious themes in the book. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's uh, things about, you know, identity and belonging, which is in all my work. And, and then there's also about aging and finding one's place in the world um, and about um, the, the really the high cost of both uh, professional and personal choices in our life, you know? Uh, and those things all started at a very heavy place for me. And I think the surprise was not that I had to do a book that was very serious or a book that was very light, but just an understanding that those themes that I had, they are very serious. They do matter a lot to me. And my work does tend to start at this sort of quieter, heavier, more serious place. And then as I get into it, I'm able to lift it up and bring it alive and find the humor and find the wit in it. So I think it was realizing that there was still a way to deal with all of those things with a slightly lighter touch and in a way that allowed people to um, be a part of it and relate to it, but also have a feeling like there was going to be hope in this whole journey for these characters. So that was, that was a surprise to me. Thank you. And then uh, second question, is there something, I love this question, is there something that you wish hadn't gotten edited out of the novel? So something that was left on the cutting room floor that you <laughs> would maybe put back in. She's got great questions. I know you said you can't, you can't go back no and change it, but one maybe can have regrets about <laughs> some things that are just not, I mean, there's always things that are like not right for the novel. Yeah, you, it's no, the kill your darlings thing, right? So maybe it's like, what was a darling that you, you had to kill? You know, um, strangely enough, it was the opposite. Like I, I wrote this book so tightly that um, it was 50 pages shorter than it is. And there was, um, there was real, there was talk of, okay, you got to open up some of this stuff. You know, we got to open up some of these scenes, open up some of these characters. And I think that was, um, that was something which uh, was unexpected. Do you know, it was, it was the, it was the opposite way around. I mean, there were a whole bunch of things which were fine that I killed, you know, <laughs> there's like scenes where Clementine went to the bank and she tried to get a bigger loan and like, you know, so that didn't, didn't matter, didn't make sense. Um, like nobody really needed to know sort of the, the daily process of it, but, uh, yeah, no, it, it, it was the opposite. It was the opposite. I'd, I'd have the opposite problem. I tend to not have to get rid of stuff. I tend to have to add stuff. Do you find that that's, that there's, that, that there's a process of when you are sort of writing back into a manuscript that, that it changes aspects that for previous drafts as well. Like you are opening up more things, but then maybe it alters yeah. a different chapter or pass. Yeah. Okay. And that was really challenging with this in the final draft is I had really opened up, um, you know, I'd, I'd opened up sections of Wendy towards the end and I'd opened up some of the other plot lines, secondary plot lines. And each time I tinkered with one of those things, I had to go back to the beginning and like rethread it. That's how I refer to it. You know, I had to go back and be like, okay, it's here. Well, now it needs to start here. And it does, it affects everything all the way along. I remember like being in this, in this room and thinking, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like, I don't know how I'm going to, like, I have to, I have to explain like Barb's whole situation at work. I don't know how I'm going to get that. Where am I going to get that scene in? You know, really uh, stressing that about that. But that's when I remind myself again, which I'm trying to do more and more because um, I do like a lot of people like hold the bar really high and very hard on myself. It's just words. It's just words. Like take them out, put them back in. It's okay. You know, you can, you can rip it all apart. You can put it back together. Like it's not surgery. It's not a body. Like I'm allowed to make changes. I'm allowed to make mistakes. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, thank you. We've reached the the top of the hour. It's 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 flown by. It's one of the most invigorating lightning rounds too that I think I've experienced. In some time. So thank you, Jane. But
But to Gina Sorrell, Daniel Rosen, thank you so much for joining us this joining us this evening uh, at home with Literati. You can buy The Wise Women from Literati. There's a link in the chat. You can also pre-order Jane's forthcoming book, uh, Shoe Story, uh, as well. Hold up your book. I'll hold up mine. Oh. <laughs> thank you. And hopefully we can have you both uh, in the store, uh, ideally together, but if not <laughs> separately and the not too distant future, but until then, we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. Uh, and to well, all of our viewers, um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, we, we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a real- oh, sh Shannon sends Negroni cheers. I think I forgot to- Oh, look. yes. Yeah. That's what I should have put in this <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, all. Thanks. Have Thank a great you. evening. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.